it's an honor to have you both here today with us. I want to start with you, Forrest. You are undeniably one of the prominent artists in the world today. But beyond this, you're also an envoy of UNESCO. Mm -hmm. You were recently appointed as an advocate by Secretary General Ban Ki-moon for the SDGs. Mm -hmm. So obviously, you're not busy at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to go back to 2012. You started your own foundation. Can you tell me more about this? And why did you decide to focus on peace and development? Yeah, I started working with uh, child soldiers there. Um, and by working with them, I was able to start to understand what some of the conflicts that they were dealing with were, and also to hear some of their uh, individual stories. And these stories about how they were dealing with uh, their lives really uh, struck me. Uh, actually, it was, it was one girl in particular, her name was Stella. And uh, she said to me, she was in an internally displaced camp, and she was in a camp, and she was surrounded by people, but totally isolated. And uh, I spoke to her, and she said, they tell me that I'm crazy, but maybe I am because I don't know why I behave the way I do. And they tell me that I'm stupid. Uh, maybe I am because I don't do the things or know what to do in all the situations anymore. I've been a, ch I've been a, a soldier since I was a child. And I watched this woman who was like totally isolated in this environment. And I said to myself, how does she reintegrate? How does she reconcile with this community? How can the community heal themselves from the anger they have towards her and her be able to bring peace to herself? And so from that, um, recognizing this eternal conflict and this conflict of violence that occurs all over the world, I decided that perhaps I could be one of the participants to be able to work alongside them to help build peace builders and uh, community builders. So I started uh, what is uh, the WPDI, uh, the Whitaker Peace and Development Initiative, uh, to work in countries all over the world. We're in five now, uh, and as well as the US that deals with gangs and violence and profiling, which is all over to find some form of healing for the pain and the conflicts that are going on in the world right now today. Yeah, and I think, I mean, this is so timely. I think when you look at the conflicts happening in the world today, um, where it's a sad reality that in most countries, women are sitting in a refugee camp instead of the negotiation table. So what exactly are you doing to change that? I know you have some work with women as well, young girls in ICT. Yeah, we have a, um, our programs are really uh, trying to find gender equality in, in every aspect. Of course, you know, you can't really find peace in the world if 50% of the world is women and they're not included in the same conversation. You know, they have to be the, not only uh, the brains behind, but also the instigators of a lot of our, of our movement towards peace. Uh, I guess for ourselves, we had uh, some of our programs, like we have one in South Africa, in Hamburg, where we, we work with five women there, and they're peace builders that have helped rebuild the community there. By rebuilding, I mean they're building homes, schools, and bringing peace to the community. And then we try to find gender equality inside of all of our programs. We've been pretty successful in South Sudan. In the beginning program, we had about 40%. Then this last program we've been working on, we only got 20%, which has been a struggle because of the different mores in the culture itself. But uh, what, what we've done is by training the people around them in gender sensitivity, uh, we're now sending them out to the villages to hopefully be able to find with the help of, actually with UN Women, we have a partnership with UN Women on this aspect of getting more women involved in the villages. And so when we get those women involved in the villages, it's really helpful. In those places we've had, uh, you know, a computer centers, literacy centers, and we haven't been able to get the women involved even there because of the social mores, because of the, the taboos and stuff. Yeah. But then when we started to meet with the women leaders, they were able to help guide us to a way to fill those, those, those classrooms with women uh, later. So. It's, it's a process that, that, that really is ongoing, but uh, will continue to keep going, you know. Yeah. And Emma, you have some interesting statistics on this as well. Yeah, so when I was looking into what you do, Forrest, which blew my mind, by the way, because I, I'm obviously well acquainted with your work and I'm such a huge admirer of yours. And then to look at your initiative and the work that you're doing, I was just amazed. But I started look, doing uh, some research into women and peacekeeping and even though we know that when women are involved in peacekeeping, <coughs> peace is more sustainable, uh, only one in 40 peace treaty signatories in the last 25 years were women. That's one in 40. Um, so that kind of, that made me realize how important what you're doing and, and making sure that we, have, that we have parity in peacekeeping and we're finding women leaders who 
our voices. Yes, definitely, and and also with uh, the grassroots portion of it. Uh, there's a lot of women who like are working because when you go to peace conferences, you'll see a lot of a, the, most of the rooms filled with women. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of people working on a grassroots level, making things happen. But I think on, a, on a, as you're talking about on the, on the level that you're, you're discussing, there's a disparity, and it has to be worked on. The same disparity that happens all over the world with, uh, like, take for instance in our in our Congress, there's only like 19% women in the United States Congress. So there's 50% women in the country. Same thing all over the world. There's all these different statistics about, uh, about government. And, and when you look at uh, 20%, I think all the countries, there's like 20, 22% of them uh, are in the parliament. We're talking about Congress for the US and the parliaments the rest around the world. And it's just, it's just something that has to be dealt with. We have to lift up and start to recognize and start to elect uh, individuals to office so that those voices can be really heard and help build society the way it should be built. So this is something that's very personal to both of you. I think you know it's safe to say that you get it. You understand why it's important. But I also want to hear, um, as you have engaged with other men, what are some of the sort of craziest things you've heard when you're talking about gender equality? <laughs> you hear lots of things, but uh, you know, I think there's a crazy, the cra there was a story that a minister told me once, and, and like, I mean. It, it only applies because I think underneath all of this, there's always this sort of insidious thing that's in the bed that people have that has to be corrected with people's psyche, the way they think about things. But this guy told me, uh, he said that, you know, they had dowries in his country, and he said that, you know, what would he look like if his daughter went to university, which he sent his daughter to university in London, and then she comes back, and he doesn't receive or she doesn't receive a dowry. How much does it lower her stature? How much does it make her look small and her not be important? And so it was, a, it was a really interesting thing because I, I disagree with him, but I understood where, what, he was, where, what, he was, what he was what he was saying. I was saying, well, this has to be dealt with on a level that's so deeply embedded. Because he's saying, everybody will tell you that um, you know, they don't do this. He said, but I'm just being honest with you. You know, this is a minister. He said, this is really the way it is, you know? And I guess we have to keep looking and see to make sure that this kind of uh, thinking starts to be reframed, that we can, like, break those frames and create new frames so that we can start to think about it differently so we can understand. Anyway, I'm sorry. Emma? Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And I think, um, you know, one of the interesting ways that... Uh, Forrest and I, in, in the line of works that we do, um, when I think about the performing arts and how we perceive um, perceive masculinity and, and still how kind of rigid sometimes those definitions and those ideas of what a, a leading man can and can't do and how he should and should act. And when I think about films like, you know, The Pursuit of Happiness, where you see a you know a man in the role of a primary caregiver, um, you know where you see Billy Elliot, uh, the color purple, um, Brokeback Mountain. You see these pieces of art uh, challenging those very rigid definitions. And I wanted to reference as well Sam Taylor Johnson did a beautiful uh, series of photographs called Crying Men, which Forrest was part of. Um, which really challenged the notion that men don't have tear ducts. And it's a very <laughs> confusing notion. Um, but um, anyway, all of these things challenge these perceptions and they make the roles that each of us get to play more complex, more whole, more real, more authentic. Um, they make our jobs more interesting and truthful. I think gender equality does that, yeah. Um, I think that's an important segue into speaking about the arts, you know, given that this is He For She Arts Week. We know, Emma, you know, a lot of the emails we get from our male supporters, uh, again, is around this um, refinement that they feel in terms of what it means to be a man um, and the pressure of what that looks like. And we know more so that it's even uh, more complex for men in the performing arts, especially guys that want to dance. Um, and in 1988, William L. did a very powerful study where he went in a shopping mall and interviewed shoppers um, and asked them to describe in 15 words or less uh, what a male ballet dancer is. And some of the words were very, very hurtful. You know, it was homosexual, frail, vain. Um, what has been your own personal experience with discrimination in the arts? Discrimination in the arts? Yes. Uh, go ahead. 
Yes. Well, I mean, I, I would say uh, the biggest area of contrast for me has actually not been uh, within the arts itself, but within probably the entertainment uh, yeah. media and tabloids. Um, I mean, uh, I was obviously a child actress who made a tra who well, is still making a transition, and um, <laughs> <laughs> That's about it. thank you. Um, I appreciate that, Elizabeth. Um, <laughs> But uh, no, and I remember, you know, on, on my 18th birthday, uh, I came out of a, I came out of my 18th birthday party, and um, photographers lay down on the pavement and took photographs up my skirt, which were then published on the front of the English tabloids the next morning. Uh, if they published the photographs uh, 24 hours earlier, they would have been illegal, but um, because I was turned 18, they were legal. Uh, and obviously, you know. Dan and Rupert, who are my male co-stars, don't wear skirts. Um, but I think that's just one of sort of one example of how my transition into womanhood was dealt very differently by uh, the tabloid press uh, than it was, yeah, than it was for uh, my male male counterpart. Yeah. Uh, Forrest, do you have anything to say to this one? I mean, I think it's funny because like when I started in the, like early in the '80s and stuff, I, I was playing uh, football on the varsity football team, you know. And at the same time, I was doing a musical. And I remember coming to the football field and um, all the guys like imitating this dance that they'd seen me do, you know. And <laughs> I think, I do think, you want to <laughs> show us? <laughs> I actually still remember the movie. It wasn't, it wasn't very complicated. <laughs> but, uh, but I think um, I think at the time there was also a lot of a lot of badgering and stuff. And I think uh, hopefully some of that's changed now. You know, I think. Certainly, we've moved forward in some ways, and and roles are, are 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 blurring. At least we have like, I don't know, the most successful movie in all time. You have a female warrior, you know what I mean, uh, yeah. fighting forward, and you have like, um, you know, Danish girl, you know, and different issues, and so that, you know, there's there's all these different things. I guess w what I'd like to say is is just that what we have to do as artists is to like really recognize uh, the sort of images that we're projecting. And, and what we're what we're doing, and because uh, because I I, I, w I was thinking when I was thinking about this conversation, it was something that I'd heard, which was about um, uh, women and, se and and sexualization of women, talking about film, and just saying that you know women are more, extremely more sexualized than men in film, and that this is done in G movies as well as R movies, so uh, our little kids are like still being framed in that example. But I think one of the other things that was really big was the, the thing that I said that 90% of, uh, the, of the role models, of the men that, who are portrayed as professionals, 90% of those people in film are men, you know? And I was like, wow, then what kind of images are we projecting? What are we imprinting in our own minds and imprinting in our children's minds? And we have to like look at that. And I guess uh, that's, uh, that's my thought about it, you know? Okay, thank you so much. I know we want to wrap up because we want to give uh, media partners an opportunity to ask questions, but I do want to end on a positive note, um, focused on solutions. Emma, you have been incredibly passionate about this issue, and what most people don't know is that you actually work full time on the He For She leadership team, um, which has also inspired you know, your decision to take a year out. What's next um, in terms of gender equality? And also, you know, what can other people do to support? Um, I think a big part of it is certainly the, a recognition of, of the problem and the, the work that, you know, uh, we have to do. Um, and then, but also being inspiring by the amount of momentum and all of the success that we're having. I think the development goals where we've outlined what we can achieve by 2030 are, are really great to have as a kind of, you know, to set a bar, to set a standard, to set something to to aim for and, and galvanize around. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that it's how we live our own lives and in our daily lives. Um, and and then being involved with the amazing work that Forrest does with, with He For She. We just launched a new website earlier this year, um, which we're trying to build a kind of solutions or a, a toolkit. And we really want to crowdsource as many different strategies from all over the world uh, that we can to try and build a really comprehensive guide to how we can make a tangible difference and how we can really, uh, you know, kind of make it happen. Uh, so yeah, lots, lots of ways. 
Thank you so much, Emma. Uh, Forrest, a last thing for you. People in the room, people watching from around the world, what can they do starting today to support um, the important work that you're doing on peace and development? Well, I mean, they can, they can go to the website, wpdi.org, uh, just to get more information and data for themselves uh, about what they would like to do. I think certainly if they want to make some form of donation, that would be helpful to the people on the ground. But I think most importantly, like, like the great work that, that, uh, that she's doing and, and, and continues to do, uh, there's an opportunity here to, to, to look at the philosophy. And the philosophy is that we can all make uh, an impact and all make a difference. And that you just choose in your own grassroots way even how you want to, to activate, how you want to uh, allow something to change, to become change makers and take that philosophy to become change makers, to make the world become the thing that you would like it to be. I think that's the most I would, I would hope for coming out of it, yeah. Very powerful remarks, a round of applause.